Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good morning to all. Uh, I'm really honored to be here today, and I would like to thank Professor Kefna and Professor Siena de Pepe for their kind invitation. Um, well, I'm here to talk to you about the EU Green Deal. Uh, I have been very much involved in the negotiations of uh, this whole package together with my colleagues at the Ministry of Shipping um, as Greek representatives. Uh, this is our ministry, by the way, in Piraeus. Uh, in Greece, we have a single ministry uh, for all maritime activities, uh, and shipping is really important for us uh, as an economy, uh, and it also incorpora incorporates the Hellenic Coast Guard. But let's move forward, uh, start with the EU Green Deal. We do have a lot to talk about, I'm afraid. Um, it, how it all started uh, on 11 December uh, 2019. The European Commission presented uh, the European Green Deal. It's uh, a groundbreaking initiative. Uh, if I may say, it's uh, Europe's plan for the future, actually. Um, it is, uh, first of all, a plan to make the EU economy sustainable, uh, to stop climate change and cut pollution, uh, to uh, turn climate um, challenges into opportunities, uh, to revert biodiversity low web loss where possible, at least, and to make the transition just and equitable for all, uh, which is quite a tricky point, also for the EU. Uh, it intends to do so by covering all sectors of the economy, outlining investments needed and financial uh, tools available, because without funding you can go nowhere, actually and explains how to um, achieve this just and equitable transition. Uh, you see, we are all Europeans, but uh, there is an existing gap between uh, European countries. Uh, there is uh, a gap between the North and the South. And as we move forward towards the sustainable economy, we as Europeans have to ensure that we'll keep this gap as limited as possible, at least, even though it is unavoidable, I guess. If I wanted to describe, okay. If I wanted to describe just only three key figures of the Ukraine deal, uh, I would mention that the EU intends to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050, uh, which is quite an ambitious target to cut down its emissions by at least 55 percent by 2030. That's uh, in a few years, actually. Uh, as compared to 1990 levels, and invest at least 1 trillion euros in sustainable investments over the na next decade. And of course, that's a lot, a lot of money, as you guess. Oh. So, what is the content of the EU Green Deal? And why all this fast, to be honest? Well, the new EU Green Deal intends to transform not only the European economy, but also the everyday life of uh, Europeans uh, by touching upon all sectors of the economy and our lives. To explain this better, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what. To explain this better, uh, the EU um, um, deal sets a zero pollution ambition for a toxic free environment, an objective for the preservation and restoration of ecosystems and biodiversity, introduces the farm to fork initiative for a healthy and environmentally friendly food system. It intends to accelerate the shift to sustainable and smart mobility, that's where shipping also comes in. Uh, raises the EU climate ambition for 2030 and 2050, aims at ensuring an affordable and secure energy for Europe. Well, what is extremely important, given the lessons learned from the Russian invasion in the Ukraine and its impact uh, on the energy supplies of Europe. And it also aspires to mobilize the whole industry for a clean and circular economy and change the way we build and renovate in Europe. So, as I said, touches upon all, all sectors of our economy. In order to put all this aspiration into practice, uh, the EU Commission presented um, and then the EU adopted its first EU climate law. 
writing in the law this goal to become climate neutral by 2050 and the 55% reduction goal by 2030. And uh, as prescribed by uh, the European uh, climate law, uh, the European Commission uh, recommended an additional intermediate target of 90% less emissions by 2040, what is also quite, quite ambitious. Well, in order to summarize uh, the key elements of the EU climate law, apart from the 2030-2050 uh, ambitious goals, and what's more, of um, uh, an aspiration of a target for negative emissions after 2050, uh, I would mention uh, the strengthening of provisions on adaptation to climate change. Let's not, let's not forget the adaptation aspect of this issue and of the coherence uh, across all union policies uh, with the climate objectives of the EU, the establishment of a European scientific advisory board on climate change to provide independent advice uh, to states and the commitment to engage with sectors to prepare sector-specific roadmaps to climate neutrality. So this is all nice and well said, but uh, something was needed to set all this into action. And this was exactly where the Fit for 55 package came in. Uh, it was presented in July 2021 20, uh, by the European Commission as a response to the requirements of the EU climate law. Following difficult intra-EU negotiations, the packets, with the exception of the Energy Taxation Directive, uh, which is still under negotiation, was wholly adopted in October 2023. It is estimated that the final package will help reduce EU GHG emissions by 57% by 2030, so that's we gained 2%. How are we going to do that? How does the 55 uh, package uh, intends to do that? Of course, through a number of legislative measures, uh, including uh, the reform of the EU emissions trading system, quite important, the new effort sharing regulation, which sets a GHG emission reductions target of 40% by 2030, uh, for the sectors that it covers at least, a new regulation that sets an enhanced overall EU-level objective of CO2 net removals in the land use and forestry sector by 2030, a new regulation for more recharging and refueling stations all across Europe, the establishment of the carbon border adjustment mechanism, so you wonder what is that again? Uh, well, that's um, a system to um, secure that uh, the GHG reduction efforts of uh, the EU uh, are not offset by simply relocating production in other less uh, climate ambitious states uh, or through the import of climate intensive products into the EU. Uh, the establishment of a social climate fund uh, to help citizens and businesses most affected by the price impacts of the UETS, the adoption of new standards for the fuels of the air and uh, maritime transport, uh, the adoption of new reduction uh, targets uh, for the CO2 emissions of vans and cars in the EU, um, the alignment of the taxation of energy products and electricity with the new climate objectives of the EU, a revised renewables energy directive, uh, we'll see that later, as well as a revised energy efficiency directive to reduce the final energy consumption in the whole EU. However, not all of these uh, measures relate to shipping. Uh, by the way, shipping accounts for 3 to 4 percent of total uh, GEG emissions in the EU, uh, corresponding to 13.5 percent of EU GEG transport emission. And uh, still, however, uh, five of these measures uh, do relate to shipping uh, the ETS, uh, the Fuel EU Maritime Directive. Uh, the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Regulation, which has been revised, the Renewables Energy Directive, also revised, 
and the taxation, uh, energy taxation directive still under negotiation, as I mentioned. But let us see how each one of them affects shipping. We shall start with the EU ETS, which has evolved into one of the world's largest carbon markets and is the main tool of the EU uh, in this fight against uh, climate change and the reduction of GHG emissions covering around 40% of total GHG emissions in the EU, uh, it uh, simply puts a price on carbon. This means that the entities covered by the ETS have to annually buy allowances corresponding to their GHG emissions. An annually decreasing cap is set um, on, um, on how many uh, allowances are set on the market each year. And this is a strong financial incentive uh, for uh, all entities to cut down their emissions. Uh, however, some, uh, fact, uh, some sectors such as the manufacturing industry, for example, uh, which are very vulnerable to carbon leakage, uh, gain some uh, free allowances, but this is also going to stop in 2030. So the UETS, uh, this was ground, a groundbreaking move uh, for the European shipping. The existing EU ETS uh, was extended to cover um, maritime transport uh, as well as uh, the aviation sector. Uh, we started monitoring uh, in uh, January 2024, so we're running the first period. The key principles are the same as for the other ETS uh, sectors. Uh, namely, shipping companies have to monitor their emissions, purchase and surrender ETS emission allowances for its own of GHG emissions to be reported under the EU ETS. All routes, all flags are treated equally. And to make the transition a bit easier, there is a phase-in period. This means that in 2025, uh, shipping companies are called to surrender allowances only for the 40% uh, of their uh, emissions, uh, while this uh, percentage uh, will be raised to 70% in 2026 uh, and to 100% from 2027 onwards. It is interesting to see which maritime emissions are covered by the system, uh, namely 50% of emissions from voyages starting or ending outside of the EU, 100% of emissions that occur between two EU ports or at birth. Uh, it also covers uh, CO2, and from uh, 2026 it will also cover methane and nitrous oxide. Um, passenger ships and cargo ships uh, above 500 GT are covered by the system, and large offshore ships will join the club from 2027 onwards. Each shipping company is attributed to the administering authority of one and only EU member state, and the data are derived from this reported under the MRV regulation, for those not familiar, I'm talking about the EU regulation on the monitoring, reporting, and verification of GHG emissions from maritime transport. So we already have a system uh, for shipping companies to count their emissions. Uh, nevertheless, they weren't paying for them until now. In, so, in case somebody would like to take a closer look on the whole process, it looks like that. I won't go into all these details. Uh, I will just mention that starting in 2025 and by the end of March of this year, each shipping company must submit verified aggregated emissions data at company level. That means for all of its ships uh, to the administering authority. Uh, of course, these data are based on the MRV uh, emissions reports for the previous years. They have to be verified by independent verifiers. And um, companies that fail to surrender allowances uh, are liable to an excess emissions penalty of 100 euros uh, per tonne of GHG emissions. And of course, they still have to pay the surrender of the allowances. They're not excused from that if they pay the penalty. Failure to comply for two or more years uh, can may result in the company ships being banned from trading in the EU, uh, which is quite a severe penalty, as you may guess. 
Moving to another major EU uh, initiative, purely for the maritime sector this time, uh, it's regulated the regulation on the use of renewable and low carbon fuels in maritime sector, known as fuel EU maritime. Uh, this was adopted in September 2023 with main um, objectives concerning the reduction of GEG emissions from shipping and um, the increase of the demand for and consistent use of uh, renewable and low carbon fuels by shipping. Nevertheless, at the same time, this regulation has to, I'm sorry, take into account to ensure uh, the continuance of the smooth operation of uh, maritime traffic and okay, the avoidance of distortions uh, in the internal market. It has, there has to be a balance between them. There are two main obligations according to the fuel EU maritime for vessels calling at EU ports. Uh, namely, the mandatory use of either uh, onshore power supply, OPS, or zero emission technologies while at birth. Uh, and uh, as a second one, the compliance with the GHG intensity indicator. Uh, Professor Fakhri mentioned about uh, this indicator. We'll come back later to this. Uh, this means that the regulation sets specific targets for the reduction of the yearly average GEG intensity of the energy used on board by ships. These targets have been set uh, at five-year intervals, ranging from 2% in 2025 to uh, raise up to 80% in 2020. Fifteen. Okay, that wasn't supposed to happen, I guess. Good luck, Kathy. It's the guy. Okay, yes, there we are. Thank you. So the exact reduction rates are shown here. They are progress from 2035 onwards is really impressive. Let us only hope that the whole market, the fuel industry, and the required infrastructure will be up to this challenge. And uh, please note that these reduction rates um, concern the whole whale-to-wake cycle. This means they address emissions from their production phase to their combustion onward. So the whole cycle. The fuel EU maritime applies to all passenger and cargo ships above 500 GT, irrespective of their flag, but not to fishing vessels. What is more interesting is that the regulation applies differently to different types of voyages. With regard to intra-EU voyages, it covers the entirety of the energy used on board ships. However, EU member states may exclude certain EU intra-voyages until the end of 2029. My country, for example, has made use of this exception for the connection with our islands. And uh, in respect to voyages that start or end in an outermost region under the jurisdiction of a member state, the regulation applies to ships for half of the energy used, uh, which is also the case with voyages between an EU port and a port of a uh, third state outside the EU. Well, of course, we have already, the, in this case, also a whole process established by this regulation. Uh, we have specific dates uh, that companies have to keep up with. Uh, it is here for anyone that wishes to take a closer look. Um, I will just mention that uh, there is, of course, a fuel monitoring plan for each ship, a fuel EU report to be verified and submitted this year. Um, there is a fuel EU database as well. And there are compliance mechanisms foreseen, such as compliance banking or pooling, and the fuel EU document of compliance uh, to be issued and checked by port authorities all around Europe. Oh, in addition, um, okay, uh, from 2030, container and passenger ships entering major 10T uh, ports. This means uh, there's a network uh, of major uh, ports 
all around Europe, the TNT network, uh, they are obliged to connect to onshore power supplies, while from 2035, zero emission berthing is required at all EU ports. So it becomes very strict, uh, the whole framework. In July, 2023, then we had the adoption of the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive, the AFIR, uh, which seeks to ensure minimum infrastructure to support this whole framework at ports uh, and elsewhere, the full interoperability uh, of the infrastructure, and also some um, payment options and conveniences all across Europe at this infrastructure. What's more interesting for us with regard to ports um, the FEA requires that in the busiest EU seaports there must be access to shore-side electricity for at least 90% of the container and passenger ships, while at least one installation of most of the inland waterway ports must provide shore-side electricity by 2030. In addition, all member states have to ensure an appropriate number of uh, adequate refueling points uh, for liquefied methane, that's also uh, a future fuel uh, for shipping um, by 2025. And uh, there is also a procedure uh, to submit uh, national policy plans how to uh, grow this market uh, and the infrastructure, which is also to be checked by the Commission by 2027. So our progress is to be checked. Not directly for the shipping sector, but uh, in any case affecting its path to decarbonization is the Renewables Energy Day Directive. Uh, it was revised uh, within the framework of Fit for 55 uh, to introduce stronger measures for the further development and uptake of renewables and help, help achieve the target of a climate neutral continent by 2050. Uh, it is interesting to see that to achieve all these targets, Red One was um, adopted in uh, 2009. Uh, it had set a target of 20% renewables by 2020. Uh, Red Two in 2018 uh, set a new target of 32 uh, renewables by 2030. And this directive was revised only five years later to raise this limit, this percentage, to 42.5%, with an aspiration for 45% by 2030. Uh, what came in? Well, it was actually the war in Ukraine and Europe's ways to become more energy autonomous um, as quickly as possible. Well, uh, with regard to the transport sector, Red 3 uh, allows member states to choose as a binding target by 2030 either a 14.5% reduction of GZ intensity from the use of renewables or an at least 29% share of renewables within the final consumption of energy. No real um, change is expected for shipping, uh, given that the fuel EU maritime already includes specific targets uh, for uh, shipping. And uh, member states with maritime ports shall strive for an at least 1.2% share of renewable fuels of non biological origin in the total amount of energy supplied to the maritime transport sector by 2030. And finally, Let's take a look at the black ship of the Fit for 55 package. Uh, the one proposal which is still under negotiation, I'm referring to the proposed directive for the taxation of energy products and electricity. This was quite an ambitious proposal, aiming at a lot of stuff <laughs> that you see here, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, rebalancing minimum rates and currency investments. Uh, at least this was the Commission's plan, uh, which, as I said, was rather, rather ambitious. With regard to shipping, uh, this proposal, the original proposal, uh, intended to end the current mandatory taxation exemption uh, of waterborne navigation and the fishing sector. So uh, these are to be taxed, the fuel used uh, from uh, now on, or were to be taxed according to the Commission. And um, 
However, considering the specificity uh, of uh, these um, fuels and the maritime uh, sector, it also allowed for uh, lower rates, taxation rates, in comparison with uh, normal uh, fuels used in normal transport. Uh, well, this was the proposal at least. Uh, it has been much modified uh, during the negotiations within the EU Council. And uh, even so, it seems rather difficult that the EU member states uh, will um, achieve an agreement on this proposal in the imminent future at least. If you ask me for the reason, I would say that um, it encompasses so many sectors uh, of economy. And its member state has its own interests, its own national economy to defend and protect. So it's not easy to find a compromise in these negotiations. Concluding with a Fit for 55 package, I would like to share with you some uh, estimations of the Maersk McKinney, McKinney Moller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping regarding the impact of European and global measures on the availability and the cost uh, of maritime fuels. Um, it is uh, a fact that a number of regional and international measures requiring the decarbonization of shipping uh, are either in force or expected to suddenly enter into force. Namely, the IMO measures that uh, Professor Fakri so nicely presented to you earlier, the GFS, um, the levy or fee-bait mechanism, uh, more details here probably, <laughs> uh, 2027, the EU ETNs, the fuel EU, which are more or less um, in force. And on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, we have the EU, EU, uh, US excuse me, Inflation Reduction Act. The estimations of the center regarding the impact of the already existing EU ETS and fuel EU measures on the price of low sulfur fuel oil, the one used by ships today, indicate that the use of LSFO from shipping will be de facto impossible uh, from uh, 2030 onwards uh, due to uh, its immensely high price. This is not a bad thing since the decarbonization of shipping is the target. Nevertheless, uh, we must not forget that ship owners are called upon to proceed to major investments uh, to be able to continue operating, to stay in business. Uh, this means proceed either uh, to costly retrofits uh, to allow uh, their existing ships uh, to consume, to burn alternative fuels, or in most cases, recycle their fleet and order, build new ones, new ships. Uh, uh, technologically advanced. However, there is still immense insecurity regarding the fuel or fuels of the future, and this definitely does not favor investments. What's more, in this graphic of the same center, we observe an important gap between the illustrative fuel demand from the expected regulations in 2040 and the illustrative fuel supply it is obvious that if research and development does not intensify in the imminent future, quite imminent, it will be rather difficult, if not impossible, for global shipping to comply with the existing regulations concerning its decarbonizations. Well, ships do need fuel for their operation. And if this is not available, global trade will be in the serious trouble, I'm afraid. And lastly, and regarding the future steps, there are some serious considerations to be taken into account by the European legislator, and not only, if I might say. First of all, the EU should ensure the existence of the necessary funds for the financing of the required investments and for strengthening the research, development, and also production of alternative fuels. Equally important is the need for consistency with the upcoming IMO measures. We need international measures for de facto international activities such as shipping. And this is directly related to the next consideration regarding the need to safeguard the competitiveness of European shipping. The EU ship owners cannot compete with other nations uh, if they are to bear so many extra costs in their operation. 
And also, uh, we have to take into account the impact on EU ports. Uh, the European ports, especially in the south, in Italy as well, I know, and in Greece, uh, we have already felt the impact of the EU ETS, which has led to massive reroutings um, from ships. And last but not least, uh, the difficult project of shipping's decarbonization needs pragmatic solutions and measures that take into account the modus operandi and the particularities of the shipping industry. Otherwise, all of us, the consumers, will be asked to dearly pay the price. So, thank you very much for your attention. That was it.